Hi everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Um, I'm Angela Goddard, the Director of Griffith University Art Museum, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which I'm recording from, uh, the Yagara and Turrbal peoples of Mianjin in Brisbane. Today, I'm having a chat with Jenna Lee um, about her work, her heritage from 2021, which is included in our current show, The Data Imaginary, fears and fantasies. And we are currently in the final week of the show. So I thought this is a great opportunity for us to chat to you, Jenna, about uh, the work um, since unfortunately you have been unable to come and see the show. So Jenna, perhaps you could introduce yourself to us and, and also where you're joining us from. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Jenna Lee. I'm a Larrakia Karijari and Waterman artist and designer. And I'm joining today from Nam, uh, Melbourne, on the land of the Boonwurrung and the Wurundjeri people, um, where I am in currently in lockdown again. Um, yeah, and, you know, haven't been able to get up to see the show, but hoping that, you know, as the world opens up a little bit more, I can get back up to Brisbane soon. We hope so. Um, <laughs> but, um, Jenna, it's, it's a wonderful work and it... It really does follow on from many other works by you, but it takes some of these aspects in a different direction. Um, Jenna, many of your works have utilised uh, historical texts, including this work that's in Data Imaginary. This, uh, her heritage is drawn from uh, these collections of words and translations of Aboriginal place names uh, that were published in the 60s and 70s by A.W. Reid. What attracted you, Jenna, to these source texts and, and how did you first come across them? Yeah, I have been working with, uh, I say, colonial or settler books now for most of my, you know, you know, professional art practice, so about three or so years. And the, the dictionaries was something I've always loved dictionaries as an object I just think they're really beautiful you know they're a book of just a list of words and I think they're stunning as an object and I was in the process of planning a whole year's body of work to coincide with the 2020 uh, anniversary of Cook's arrival and COVID of course meant that that just wasn't a part of public discussion and so i I kind of felt like I didn't need to make the works anymore. So I needed to find a new book to work with. Um, and I came across uh, a little handbook on eBay of Aboriginal words and it just lists them. There's not even the ones I use now at least have a little, you know, number key next to them, which say maybe which state they came from. But this original one is just a list of words. And that was kind of, I was hooked then. Um, just I found them so interesting because Aboriginal isn't a language you can learn. It's, you know, uh, just as there are European languages, there are 250 Aboriginal languages. So it's kind of saying to someone, I'm going to learn European, uh, which you, you can't do. Um, so it just was really interesting and in a kind of dark humour way, quite funny to me in a very sad and ridiculous because these were reference books that were completely useless. Um, and I just was really compelled to work with them and I've been working with them now for about 18 months straight and don't see that stopping anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, it's very compelling, this sense that these are very just dislocated words taken from completely different contexts, that if you tried to say a sentence in these words, it would just be gibberish, basically. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the particular text that you use in her heritage, the text kind of appears and disappears. It's like it's soaking into paper and then vanishing. And this kind of bounces across four screens. Can you talk about these particular phrases and, and what have drawn you to, to this specific part of the text? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really important for me that I don't actually use any of the Aboriginal words listed, um, kind of the rest of my you know, bodies of work is about presenting them in a new way where they're not actually understood because most of these languages aren't mine. There are occasionally words in there that I recognise. Um, but so it's really important to me not to actually use the Aboriginal words. But there's a few paragraphs um, of introduction text, um, which just gives, you know, very commercial, you know, this book is for you, you know, you might want to name your house one of these words. So 
I took the one of the paragraphs, I think it might be the very first paragraph from this book and just separated all the words and then put them back together. Not all of the words, of course, but just wanted to take the sentiment of the introduction and essentially translate it. Um, and the very first line, her heritage possesses, it's kind of my favorite line because I wanted it to kind of articulate that these languages are something that did belong to us. We we owned them in that it was and has always been our right to know them. Um, and that was kind of taken away. So I wanted just to kind of to set up that, you know, inherently as First Nations people, we have this possession um, that a lot of us are working really hard to, you know, get back. And often the documents we're having to use to relearn languages are the same documents that would have been used as reference for this book. So it's kind of this full circle work about the process of relearning language um, and how these documents are kind of that double-edged sword of being contributing to that homogenization and loss of language, but also now what we're using to, to relearn language, which is just really interesting and, you know, just a part of the history of this place. I mean, uh, so the this exhibition is called the Data Imaginary, and um, in terms of you know using and representing data, I can see what you're saying. Uh, in terms of language, there's a certain kind of sovereignty, and in terms of and is that what you're articulating in terms of these uh, these words, these um, these texts. Uh, asserting sovereignty perhaps in terms of what this data might mean for these different communities? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, my, my work going forward and including this work is really about looking at, well, who had the right to uh, this, this particular book as part of an entire series, which I'm sure made the author quite a lot of money, um, you know, and that this was always ours to have and to know and and of, of course share in ways we see fit but that sharing often meant um you know there was a loss of something as well um you know that the sharing of languages by aboriginal people to anthropologists or um linguists often meant that that was then published without recognition of the original so it's kind of yeah, sovereignty is a really good way of thinking of it. I'm just, I'm interested in that power and how I now can kind of take back a little bit of that or at least start having conversations around that. Um, I like to think of my practice as being quite gentle, um, even though, you know, these are quite, some of the sentences in these introductions are just so condescending and awful, but that's kind of not what I ever want my work to be reread as. Um, there's kind of this, gentle massaging of of what was already there into something new mm. and what does the word data itself mean to you when you think about you know how it's being used in the context of this exhibition and perhaps your own perspectives on the also the fears and fantasies aspect of the title jenna can you share with us yeah data is such an interesting word and i think um you know, in my everyday life, I would originally think of, of course, you know, like data rights and, and things. But if I was to really think about my own practice, very little of what I do incorporates anything new. So there's almost a material data as well in what I'm using. And I'm quite interested in taking things that already exist and reinterpreting them, which I think all of the artists in the show who work with data are doing that. They're finding things that are that exist and then transforming them or interpreting them or representing them. And that's really interesting to me. I think, you know, it's, I, when I worked out what I wanted to do with art, I knew that it had to be coming from something and that I was interested in transforming that, you know, very rarely will I go and buy a brand new material and create something from scratch. There's always this reinterpreting or yeah, reimagining. Um, of what I do, which I guess, yeah, if I was to really think about it, everything I work with is kind of data. Mm, I mean, that's fascinating to me. And also I think in terms of your own background, because Jenna, you trained initially as a designer, 
um, here at the Queensland College of Art, um, although currently you're in Nam, Melbourne. But maybe you could tell us about that training and how these crossovers have been emerged in your practice between, you know, art and design and, and this kind of interdisciplinarity or, or multidisciplinarity that we see within your practice. Yeah, and it's an interesting one. I should say that this particular work was created in collaboration with Cy Cullen, who's a motion graphics artist. I personally, if you see a work of mine that moves, I haven't done the movement um, and Cy just has an incredible way of interpreting hand gestures and very flowery words into um, movement. So I, you know, definitely don't have the skills there, but I did, I did my undergraduate um, in visual communication design at QCA and it, you know, if you was to look at my art practice on its own, you might not know that I am a graphic designer, but actually my practice now working with books as material is because I specialised in typesetting um, as a graphic designer and I'm still a graphic designer specialising in book cover design. So it's kind of this, you know, to me, the progression has made a lot of sense. Um, I was always very interested in language and type and typesetting and through my favorite part of design and you know I did typography the subject typography one two three and four at QCA and we learned how to understand language or words I should say and letter forms and that helped me understand them as being something visual um, so there is this aspect of my training as a graphic designer that absolutely feeds into my work now although in a way the art practice has been to get away from the computer screen and be working again with um, materials which is something you kind of miss when you're a graphic designer there's a lot of screen time um, so that has been really interesting and recently I had to reflect on kind of my prog career progression and realize that you know someone asked me poetry and I, I see this work her heritage as being a uh, somewhat of a poem um, you know is poetry important to me and thinking back to high school I hated poetry I didn't there was no visual cues for me to be able to comprehend what was happening um, but doing design as my undergrad helped me see words as being visual in themselves and so now I, I see words and anytime I do use text they're picked both for their meaning but also for their aesthetics and their sound there's kind of three reasons why I might work with a word like one of my favorite words is native because visually like the letter forms all together are just really beautiful but then also what it can represent so that, that has been really interesting to reflect on now as someone who struggled with reading and writing in school to come out and be a text you know text based artist or yeah it's just an interesting you know, progression <laughs> So it's often these kind of historical typographies that you really enjoy kind of seeing and appropriating and using. Do you tend to just like uh, just borrow them wholesale or do you then manipulate them yourself as well, Jenna? Yeah, I mean, all of the, the text-based works I do, I'm always hand rendering the text and there is one font that I do and it's actually one of the first assignments I did at QCA was a type specimen book. And it's the font that I picked for my type specimen book. And so I just know that font really, really well. And so all of my work is hand rendered, even in um, her heritage. Like it, it, it's still been hand painted by me and then put back into the computer. So I think having my hand involved is really important. Um, but I, I do love the serif fonts because of that kind of era I'm trying to evoke. Um, and, you know, books are still typeset predominantly in serif fonts because they're, they're beautiful to read and that's kind of why I love using them. But taking out decisions like what font am I going to use for this particular body of work has been a way to move away from my design practice, whereas, you know, my design practice still every project, it's a new font and, you know, playing with fonts, whereas this is it's more so about the words themselves, um, which has been quite freeing to just go, no, for my practice, or at least for now, this is the font I use. Yeah, I think it's fascinating thinking, and as you're talking about those different aspects of your practice feeding into each other, there seems to be a lot of 
back and forth, not just one way or, yeah, yeah, that's really wonderful. Now, Jenna, I know, you know, we can see that you're in lockdown in Melbourne um, and we're so disappointed that you haven't been able to come and see the show in person in Brisbane, but hopefully for Flinders University Art Museum next year, um, that can definitely happen. But I know from your social media and other kind of conversations that you have been quite busy in lockdown um, and had lots of things kind of happening for you. So maybe you could tell us a bit about what you're working on at the moment. Mm, absolutely. And I am one of the very fortunate artists currently to have a home studio. Um, artists aren't considered essential workers. So um, if you have an out of home studio, you can't access it right now. Um, so I'm really fortunate to have a home studio. It's, it is this little room that I'm sitting in. Um, and I have I have been busy graphic I still am a practicing graphic designer I say by day because I tend to do that work in the morning um, and I primarily design book covers at the moment and exhibition catalogues which is has been incredibly wonderful over the past few weeks to be getting images of exhibitions um, to look at because I haven't been able to go to many this year so that's been really wonderful but I think in terms of my art practice I'm about to pack and send works for a solo exhibition happening at Artspace Mackay, which very likely I will also not get to see, um, which is okay. <laughs> um, that will open on the 22nd of October and it's called Contained um, and will feature artist books and um, a few reimagined works from my early practice, which through experimentation I've perfected, I guess, or not perfected, but made better. Um, and so I wanted to recreate those works because earlier editions of them I've retired because I'm not happy with how they've aged. So that's been a really nice process to kind of have time to reflect on my work and, and recreate it in a way that I'm happy with. Um, and then this year, which it just opened, although none of us can go in and see it, um, I've been doing a, a program with the Curry Heritage Trust called um, Black Design and we've been learning contemporary jewellery skills for a year through workshops at um, RMIT. So that was installed last week. And hopefully when things open up, we can all go in and see it. And that, was, that has been a really wonderful uh, project to be a part of because we still do the weekly Zoom catch-ups and things. So it's nice to still be connected with, you know, community around. But, yeah, I think that's... My, my main work, uh, you know, the various art fairs and things are coming up as well, but who knows, again, they, they may not, or if they do, they might be online. So it's, yeah, it's been, a, it's been an interesting six months because I think after Melbourne had, I think we were about nine months of predominantly out and okay, you know, sporadic lockdowns. We were kind of all planning on things being open. Um, so this last lockdown has come as a little bit of a surprise but you know we're getting through it okay great well thank you so much jenna for talking to us today and giving us a bit more of the the background and the context for your beautiful work her heritage we um well if our viewers are in queensland you can see the exhibition for another couple of days until uh saturday the 18th um, but also go online to our website, thedataimaginary.com and view the works by all of the artists in the exhibition. Looking forward to the Flinders University Art Museum leg of the show next year. Fingers crossed we can all make it there. <laughs> and um, yes, thank you so much, Jenna. It's just been wonderful to, to chat to you and hear about more about this wonderful work. Thank you. And thank you so much. It uh, gave me a really good reason to put some professional clothes on today. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Jenna. <Okay. laughs>